unraveling quickly until it becomes very difficult to buy that there ever was, or even could have been, any historical figure at the center. Nailed by David Fitzgerald is now available at atheistaudiobooks.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to the cleverly titled Phil Ferguson Show. With me, I have Dr. Abby Hafer, and she is a zoologist and author, and her book, of course, is called Not So Intelligent Design. And as promised, we were going to talk about the wedge document. Many of my listeners may know about this, but some this will be new, so explain this to me. Okay, the wedge document is basically a document that its writers wish you didn't know about. Um, it was put. It was an internal document uh, done by the Discovery Institute, which is sort of an intelligent design and creationism and other bits of um, conservative religious anti-science and anti-modernity. Um, it's a think tank out in Seattle. And we're using the word and think loosely. What's that? We're using the word think very loosely. Yeah, they call themselves a think right. tank. We'll put it that way. Anyway, and so they created this document on how they were going to make the United States a more biblical society. That is their goal. And they decided that the way to get started on this grand project was by having intelligent design taught in American public schools. And, I mean, first off, let's get the obvious out of the way. Intelligent design is religion. And creationism is religion. And they are basically the same thing, creationism and intelligent design. I can talk about that in a little while if you want to. Yes. And, of course, in the United States, the Constitution has the Establishment Clause saying that we have separation of church and state. And teaching this version of religion, or indeed any other version of religion, as science in American public schools is illegal. It is not only, but it is, in addition, bad science. It is not only unconstitutional, it is also bad science. But, of course, what the Discovery Institute wants to do is teach their version of religion to all Americans and make them accept it. And they saw getting intelligent design into the science curriculum as their first step in this grand project. It was their thin end of the wedge for taking over American society, basically. And so they were going to get intelligent design taught, they wanted, uh, taught in American public schools in the science curriculum. So the wedge document, which was officially called by them the wedge strategy, outlined how they were going to do this. And they were going to do a lot of writing, and they were going to make lots of public appearances and they would they one of their goals was to get into debates with real scientists about evolution which by the way is one of the reasons why you should never debate these guys because it's what they want they want the legitimacy that be that appearing with real scientists will give them it makes it look like they're talking about real science when they are not but anyway so they cranked out this big document, which was just kind of an internal memo for them. But uh, they, this was back in the days when you had to take something to a copy center in order to get it reproduced. No, they didn't. So they took it to a copy center, and somebody at the copy center saw it and said, wow, this is really dangerous, and leaked it to the World Wide Web, what? which is why <laughs> you can... Uh, to this day, just Google the wedge strategy. It's also known as the wedge document, but its official title was the wedge strategy. And it'll pop right up. And if you go to some nice place like the National Center for Science Education, which, by the way, is a great organization, and they do a lot of work towards combating creationism and intelligent design wherever it pops up, um, 
they have both the original document, um, you know, a, a nice facsimile of the original document, which you can click on and look at with all of its little illustrations and so on. And they also just have it as plain text if all you want to do is read it. Um, you can find it lots of places, but the National Center for Science Education are good folks, and you can be absolutely sure that they have not doctored the document in any way. Um, so that would probably be a good place to look for it. Now, wouldn't they argue that intelligent design is not creationism? Of course they argue that, uh, because creationism was was pronounced to be religion by the Supreme Court in 1987 in a very famous case to those of us in the field called Edwards versus Aguilard. And at that point, creationism, uh, it was decided, is religion and therefore cannot be taught in American public schools as science. Well, of course, the people who are in favor of creationism didn't like that ruling, so they immediately renamed creationism intelligent design and pretended that it was something completely different. And part of this is just because they really, really want people to accept their religious teachings, and part of it is because they really, really want to make a lot of money uh, by selling high school and other, other school text, biology textbooks. And so in 1987, they actually had a quote-unquote, and this is one of these contradictions in terms, but there we are, they had a creationist biology textbook that they were developing in the hopes of being able to sell it, you know, across the country to public schools everywhere, this being a huge market. Wow, that, that is when, kind of mind-numbing, but, but that got destroyed and, and it ended, right? That got destroyed by the 1987 Supreme Court decision that said that creationism is religion. At that point, they were limited only to, you know, whatever religious schools they could peddle the book to. So isn't it just remarkable in 1987, the same year that creationism was declared to be religion by the Supreme Court, they discovered intelligent design? What luck. And the next thing you know, that very same textbook came out as an intelligent design textbook instead of a creationism textbook. And so they, they rewrote the whole book then? Uh, n no, they took out the word creationism and put in the words intelligent design and took out the word creationists and put in the words design proponents. They otherwise did not change the content. They just changed those words. And there are many, many telltale signs of this, whole passages of the book that are precisely the same. And I should explain, the textbook was in development at the time. So, of course, the finished product differs in various um, slight ways from the textbook as it was being developed in 1987. Uh, but the point is that the very next internal version that they were working on um, was exactly the same except for those particular word replacements. And there was one beautiful telltale sign, one of those things that you just have to love. There was one place where they took out the word creationists and put in the word the words design proponent, but did not do a complete job. So the final um, the, the the final thing that is printed there is C design proponent proponentists. So C design is one word. Yeah. Proponentists is the next word, which is clearly a case where the word creationists was taken out and the word design proponents was put in, but they did not do a complete scrubbing of the word creationists. Uh, so you have this very weird and telltale intermediate step, which makes it very clear that all they were doing was substituting intelligent design for creationism so they could keep going with this supposedly grand project that they have of making us all accept their religion, uh, and, of course, selling lots and lots of biology textbooks. 
Lots of textbooks. To now, make, you, you to had make them rich. You had mentioned um, in your talk there's there's animals that shouldn't exist. Give me an example of one of those. Okay. Well, there's a, there are a couple of really lovable animals. Um, I will start uh, with the one that is immortal. Oh, and, oh. you know, one of the things that religions do over and over and over again is try to convince people that if you accept that religion, you can cheat death. You will have life everlasting. That's, you know, usually one of the biggies for almost every religion, whether it's right. Zoroastrianism or Baha'i or Judaism or Islam or Christianity or lots of other religions. Buddhism, too. They all have some kind of, okay, when you die, you don't really die if you accept this religion and you follow all the rules. That's one of their big selling points. Yeah, it sounds pretty, pretty um, sexy. Sounds pretty sexy. And the thing is, of course, that, you know, cheating death is something we really, really want to do. Nobody wants to die. You know, we are this uh, species that... Uh, is acutely aware that we are mortal and we don't like it, which is why we've invented all these religions and why cheating death is all over uh, literature as well. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the picture of Dorian Gray, Faust, of course, all these things are about not dying. And so you'd think that the creator... Um, would have given us that if it were possible. And yet it turns out that there is an immortal being out there already, and it's a jellyfish. There is actually a creature. In fact, it is now, its nickname is the immortal jellyfish. And basically, it does not have to die ever. It can die because it can succumb to predation, Right. And we have not yet come up with a cure for being eaten. Uh, but, on the other hand, it does not have to die. If it becomes wounded, diseased, or starving, or even just getting very old, what it can do is essentially de-develop um, down to um, what, in for a jellyfish, it's called the polyp stage which is a sort of undifferentiated, think of it almost like a larva or less than a larval stage. Um, but then this polyp will then regrow new little immortal jellyfish, and off they will go. So the animal can literally rejuvenate itself. It not only doesn't have to die, but it can literally become young again. Well, that that's and neat. Can can we can we like take some DNA out of it and and add it to humans? We don't know. Um, this was only recently discovered. Um, it brings up all kinds of remarkable questions. I should say we've known about this jellyfish for a while, but we didn't realize it could do this until somebody actually started looking at these tiny, tiny jellyfish. And it's hard to even explain how small they are. But the point is, somebody put them in, the, in an aquarium and realized that they were doing this. So, you know, we've only recently figured this out about these guys. And so exactly how they do it, I don't think we know yet, but doubtless we will. Excellent. So Excellent. anyway, you know, it's, it's all very interesting. But as I said, you know, seriously... Considering how much stock religion puts in being able to give you immortality, um, you wonder why jellyfish just got immortality straight off the bat without having <laughs> to subscribe to any religion. God, God loves jellyfish. Now, what, what is your favorite bad creationist argument? What, what, what do you like? What's fun for you? The favorite bad creationist argument... Um, well, it will tend to be anything that has to do with, oh, you don't really understand. It's actually really good design, but you are just not capable of understanding how it is good design, actually. Um, that is actually, and this is something that is brought out all the time. 
And so that they're saying that it's it's good design simply because it exists.